<laughs> All right, well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, our text for tonight is going to be a long one. Uh, Genesis chapter 7 through chapter 9, verse 17. So there's a lot of ground that we're going to be covering. Um, by way of introduction, I'd like to begin by saying one of the most famous stories in all of the Bible is the story of the flood and Noah's building of an ark. It's one of the most often told stories to children. Uh, sometimes little kids' nurseries are decorated with this theme, and any kid who grew up around church has certainly heard this story. In fact, kids that don't grow up in, this, uh, in the church, they very likely to have heard the story of the flood and Noah building the ark. Now, th this story is, in my opinion, it's one of the most glorious moments in all of the scripture, but tragically, the main point of it is commonly missed by people as the story tends to get boiled down to merely lessons about why you don't want to be a bad guy like the, the mean people in the world and why you should be a good guy like Noah. And then, look, if you get out a picture uh, book, then we tend to take that and, and we use it to teach our kids the name of animals. And it doesn't really get beyond that. Now, I certainly believe it is good and biblical to imitate the faith of the saints in the Bible. And there's also nothing wrong with teaching your kids the name of the animals from a Noah's Ark children's story. But the, uh, the, the problem is that none of those things is the main point of the flood story. And so, as I mentioned, when we started this series, Genesis is dripping with Christ. And Luke said that all of the scriptures point to Christ in Luke 24, 27. And Jesus himself told us in John 7, 37 through 39, he said, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within it. What scriptures? Well, at the time that Jesus spoke in John 7, the scriptures he's referring to in that text are the Old Testament because the New Testament didn't even exist. And so it's my hope that as we examine the flood story tonight and consider its Christ-centeredness, that your faith might be strengthened and that God will cause streams of living water to flow from within you. That's a promise that we have from Jesus. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. And the scripture in the flood episode speaks powerfully to Christ. So that's my prayer uh, over all of you guys uh, tonight and myself in relation to uh, the flood story. <clears throat> now, last time that we were in Genesis, we saw that at the birth of Noah, at the end of chapter 5, his father rightly recognized him as a deliverer. In addition to this, we also saw that Noah is the embodiment of the seed of the woman promise, as is evidenced by the fact that the, tell, the text told us that Noah had found favor with God, it told us that he was righteous and blameless, and that all of those things were bound up in the fact that he walked with God. And as God gave Noah instructions for building the ark, Hebrews 11 told us that it was evidence that Noah walked in the obedience of faith and was an heir of the righteousness that is by faith. <laughs> Noah persevered in building the ark and warning of God's judgment for 120 years even though nobody outside of his family listened to him. And so with those reminders about Noah, I'd like to begin our study tonight, which again is Genesis chapter 7, uh, all the way through chapter 9, verse 17. So if you turn to Genesis 7, uh, that's where we will get started. <clears throat> now as we begin chapter 7, we can see that essentially what's going to happen is I'm going to argue this up front. God is sending creation into the ark through Noah. So we begin. let's begin just with verse 1. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. So there it is right there. Noah is the righteous head. And in connection to Noah, the righteous man, his household will enter the ark which we will see the ark is the vessel of salvation that righteous Noah has constructed through his obedience of faith. Noah and his family are the human beings who will be saved through the ark. 
And then as we go through verses 2 through 9, we get a bigger and more fuller picture of what's also going to be part of this salvation. Verse 2. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and its mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and its mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I'll send rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I've made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Noah was six hundred years old. When the, flood of the, when the flood of waters came upon the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives uh, with him went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Of clean animals and of animals that are not clean and of birds and of everything that creeps on the ground, two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah as God had commanded. And after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. So we see in these verses now that, that seven pairs of clean animals and one pair of unclean animals will also enter the ark as well. And the end of verse 9 tells us that they went into the ark with Noah as God had commanded. And it was in Noah that his household and the animals entered the ark. And without a connection to Noah, nobody would even know a flood was coming, much less flee to the ark. <clears throat> now, after entering the ark, we read the coming of God's judgment in the next three verses. Let's look at uh, verses 10 through 12. <clears throat> And after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month of the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened, and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. This is a really powerful explanation here. The fountains of the great deep. What's that? What's the great deep? The great deep is the ocean. So the fountain of the great deep opens up and water's coming from there. And in addition to that, uh, we, we have the description of the windows of heaven opening up and rain pouring down from the sky. So from the ground up, water's coming, and from the sky downward, the waters of judgment are filling the earth. It's coming from below, it's coming from above, and everything is going to be deluged in the waters of judgment. <clears throat> Now, verses 13 through 16, we again have an account of Noah and all who were with him entering the ark. Let's go uh, to verse 13. On the very same day, Noah and his sons Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with him entered the ark, they and every beast according to its kind, and all the livestock according to uh, their kinds, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature, they went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. So here we see God in his grace. He shut Noah, his family, and all of the animals whom will come to represent a new creation. He shut them into his saving ark. The ark is a vessel of salvation that God provided for. And we saw in chapter 6, last time we were in Genesis, he gave all these details about it. Every single detail of the construction of this ark, of this vessel of salvation, it was given to Noah. And it shows that salvation is all of God and not of man. It wasn't left to Noah to construct anything of the ark. All of the details were given to him because salvation belongs to the Lord. And we will see this vessel of salvation, it's sufficient to save them <clears throat> uh, and, and allow them to enter into a renewed creation. Verses, now, as we keep going on in the story, verses 17 through the first half of verse 23, they are some of the bleakest verses in the Bible. And they read like this. Verse 17. The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. 
The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep, and all the flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. God has brought a comprehensive judgment. Land, mountains, all life forms, including man, they have been thoroughly judged by God for the pervasive wickedness that filled the earth. The seed of the serpent has been judged, and death death now fills God, God's creation through the waters of judgment. All of the animals, all of the birds, human beings, what were they commanded at creation? Be fruitful and multiply. Fill it with life. Now God turns that around, and he's now filled the creation with death at the judgment of the seed of the serpent. And the account of the survivors, that's given to us in the second half of verse 23 as well as in verse 24. So let's take a look at that. The end of verse 23. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. It was exclusively those who were with Noah or those who were in Noah that survived the floodwaters. Outside of Noah, there was no salvation for any living thing, not even a lizard. Life and salvation are tied to Noah. And these floodwaters were present on the earth for 150 days or about five months. And for the seed of the serpent, these floodwaters were waters of judgment. But for the seed of the woman, the floodwaters were waters of salvation and renewal. God has brought judgment and deliverance upon the earth just as he had promised. And as we move into chapter 8, we will see the outworking of his deliverance. And as we come to chapter 8, I want to tell you in advance uh, that chapter 8 is not just about how Noah and his family were saved, but rather it's a picture of God renewing creation. I'm going to point this out to you as we go through it. Chapter 8 has strong parallels to the creation account itself. And it becomes a literal type of what's going to come in Christ. The beginning of chapter 9 also continues this creation parallels as well. And remember, originally there weren't any chapters. So anyways, uh, let's begin uh, verse 1. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth. And the waters subsided. So having brought fierce judgment upon the earth, God in his mercy, he remembered all the life that was on the ark and his promise to bring salvation. And it's significant to note that as soon as the text tells us God remembered this, he sent a wind to blow over the earth and the waters subside. Now, the word for wind in Hebrew is ruah. What do you think it's the same word used for? Spirit. And <clears throat> that's the word used in the creation account in Genesis 1-2 where the Spirit's hovering over the waters. God's ruah is hovering over the waters as the work of creation begins. Similarly, here in this creational renewal by God, we read that he sends a ruah or a wind over the earth, which is what? Covered with waters. And this wind's hovering over the earth and the waters are subsided so that this place might become habitable. So just as God's ruah is hovering over the earth in, the, in creation in Genesis 1, we see a ruah from God hovering over the work of creational renewal as well in the flood episode. Now let's look at verse 2. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. And rain from the heavens was restrained. So the fountains of the deep, the water stops, rains from the heavens, rains that come from the sky. That was no longer taking place anymore. 
So there is a sense here that the water is now separated from what? The sky. It's no longer coming from the sky. That's exactly what God's creational work was in Genesis 1, 6 through 8, when God separated the water from the sky. As we continue in chapter 8, verse 3 through 5, give us this description. And the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters continued to abate until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So here we see the waters are receding and there is some dry ground emerging in the form of mountaintops. Later in verses 13 through 14, we'll see that the land completely dries out. What is that parallel to in the creation account? Genesis 1, 9, it says God caused what? Dry ground to emerge. <clears throat> in verses 6 through 12, we see Noah begins to test just how far the waters had receded by sending a raven and a dove to test this out. This is verses 6 through 12. Let's pick it up there. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made, and he sent forth a raven, and it went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she returned to, the, she returned to him to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove from the, uh, out from the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days, and he sent forth the dove, and she did not return to him anymore. So through this test with the raven and with the dove, Noah comes to realize when exactly the waters have subsided to the point of the land being habitable. And it's through this test that what happens? Once again, birds fill the air. And it parallels Genesis 1, 20 through 23, when God created birds to do what? Fill the skies, inhabit the skies. <clears throat> Uh, let's move to verse 13 and 14. We've touched on this a little already. In the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. So again, here the, now we see the renewed earth is suitable for Noah and the animals to inhabit once again. And again, as I already mentioned, just as we saw in the creation account, God had to first prepare a place that was suitable to be inhabited by life. He had to do that before he filled the place with life. So just as we saw that in Genesis 1, so also we see here in Genesis 8 that through the drying out of the earth, a place is now suitably habitable for life. Let's move forward into verses 15 and 16. <clears throat> then God said to Noah, go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. So here we see that Noah emerges as the head of his family and he leads them out onto a renewed creation by the command of God. And not only does Noah lead his family out, but also he's the head of a new creation, as is evidenced by the fact that he's also going to lead the animals out. Let's read that, verse uh, 17. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you uh, of all flesh, birds and animals, and every creeping thing that creeps on the ground, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah brings these animals out. They, they come out in Noah. And once again, it is restated that these animals are to be what? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, just as was the case in, the first, in creation in Genesis 1. It's another parallel. 
Verses 18 and 19 go on to say, So Noah went out, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every bird, everything that moves on the earth, went out by families from the ark. So now we have Noah, like Adam before him, he is now the head of this creation. He's led his family, and he's led creation out of this vessel of salvation that he had constructed through the obedience of faith. He's led them to a renewed earth. And the first thing that Noah does is worship God. Verse 20 through 22. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and he took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird, and he offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, they shall not cease. So God here is pleased with Noah and he accepts his sacrifice. And in response to this sacrifice, God promises creational order will exist perpetually as long as the earth exists. Seasons, day, night, hot, cold, all of them will function orderly as long as the earth exists. What does that remind you of? Genesis 1 verses 14 through 19, this parallels strongly to that. In Genesis 1, 14 through 19, God said that what? The stars and the sun and the moon, they're in place to help man with what? Seasons and calendars and day and night and time. That's exactly what God is pledging here in Genesis 8. That's exactly what he's pledging will remain in order as long as the earth exists. So by the end of this chapter, things look amazing. In fact, one might think that maybe the consummate fulfillment of the seed of the woman promise is here. I mean, I would argue there's probably no other place in Scripture where it looks like, man, this really might be it. I mean, this is probably the most powerful example. I mean, God just wiped out everything on the earth. Can you think of anything bigger than that? I mean, not even the Exodus is bigger than that. This is huge. So it's like, man, the promises are here. I mean, things are happening in a really grand scale, and God is being extremely intentional in showing the parallels between the creation account from Genesis 1 and the renewal of creation here in the flood. So it looks amazing. But unfortunately, in verse 21, God again tells us how wicked man is by saying that his promise to not flood the earth again, it's not owing to the goodness of man, but instead he describes man still as those whose intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. This is the first indicator that things are not going to be okay after the flood. And as we move into chapter 9, the creation parallels continue. Let's look in verses 1 through 4. And God blessed Noah and his sons, and he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. There it is again. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Everything moving that, uh, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life. Uh, that is its blood. So here we have in these verses, the creation mandate is restated to the image bearers at the end of the renewal of creation. And we're going to see it again in verse 7. And again, this is the, the very same mandate was given to Adam and Eve in Genesis 1, 26 through 28 at the completion of the creation account. Once again, at the completion of the renewal of creation in Genesis 8 and 9, once again, the earth is to be populated with image bearers who will fill the earth with the knowledge of God. And at this command here to be fruitful and multiply, he's speaking to the seed of the woman. Additionally, in these verses, we see the provision of food is again made for mankind when God says he gave every plant as well as every moving thing to man for food. 
And the provision of food parallels Genesis 1:29 through 30, where God had stated he made a provision of food for the life that he placed in his creation. I mean, there, there's almost nothing that isn't paralleled in the renewal of creation here in the flood that, that doesn't parallel from the creation account in Genesis 1. Now, as much as all of this clearly parallels the creation account, if you read it closely, you'll notice something's wrong. In verses 2 through 4, God tells Noah that the animals are going to be terrified of man. And that now man, man can eat the animals. That's quite a bit different from chapter 2, verses 18 through 20, when Adam had the animals and he's naming them and everything is harmonious and orderly. Now he's going to kill them and eat them. Like that's not the same picture. So we also see other concerning problems pertaining to death after the flood. And, and we, we see these issues of death, which is the ultimate sign of the curse, uh, articulated in verses 5 through 6. And for your lifeblood, I'll require a reckoning from every beast. I will require it uh, and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by, his, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. So now we have stated to us that animals will be aggressive and will even kill mankind. And mankind will continue to kill mankind. And therefore, God institutes the consequence of death for the animal or for the man who kills another image bearer. This isn't life. This isn't shalom. This is not peace. This is not Genesis 2. This is not the full overturn of the curse. I and mean, we can already see it right here. Something isn't right. And then after giving instruction in how to deal with taking life, in, in verse 7, God restates the creation mandate to fill the earth uh, with life, and he promises to the creation that he will never again destroy it with floodwaters in verses 8 through 12. So let's go ahead and look at those. Verse 7. And you be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. So there it is, creation mandate restated to man. Verse 8. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. And so as man and beast live out their days under the goodness of God, God tells them the sign of God's covenant to not flood the earth uh, it is going to be through a rainbow, the very thing that appears during the time of rain. And even in the fiercest rain, rainstorm, the rainbow is to give comfort and hope that God will not destroy the creation with floodwaters. And I get that from verses 13 through 17. So let's read that. I've set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. So having completed the flood story, having argued that this story points to Christ, I want to now say a brief word about typology. For those of you who are not familiar with typology, typology is a particular kind of prophecy in the Old Testament. It's not the kind of prophecy that says, hey, at 
6.30, Augustine is going to win the lottery. It's not that kind of a prophecy where it's like predicting something verbally in advance. It's a different type of prophecy. It is an event or a person or a thing that takes place as an unfolding of God's promises and purposes. And it, it, the, the type itself represents a certain level of fulfillment of God's promises, but ultimately the type falls short of the final fulfillment of God's promises. And when the type falls short, it ends up point, being a picture that points to a greater fulfillment than itself. I know that's a mouthful. So here's another way to say it. When you encounter a biblical type, a person, a thing, or an event, it should be really clear how that type is an outworking of God's promise. It should also be really clear that it falls short of the consummate fulfillment of that promise. And then when you look at the type, you get a glimpse of what the final fulfillment's going to look like. Let me explain that in terms of the flood. Clearly, this story of the flood is an outworking of the seed of the woman promise. Noah is explicitly seen as a deliverer at the end of Genesis 5. Noah is clearly in the line of the restoration of the seed of the woman. Noah is explicitly declared by the scripture to be a righteous man who walks with God. Noah is clearly one who walks in the obedience of faith. Noah is clearly the one uh, through whom the creation will be spared the judgment of God because he constructed a vessel of salvation in obedience to the Lord. Those things are all able to be clearly articulated from the scripture. They're clearly defended from the scripture. They are literal and historical realities. Noah did construct a vessel of salvation. The creation entered the ark through Noah. And after the flood took place, Noah literally led out man. And he literally led out living creatures into a renewed creation. And the text literally gave us many parallels between the account of emerging onto a renewed creation after the flood and the original creation account. We also see the seed of the serpent is quite literally judged in spectacular and sweeping fashion as God brought the flood upon them as a punishment for their sin. So that should be clear, I'm hoping, how the Noah story is an outworking of the seed promise. Okay. But what else did we see in the story? Death's still going to exist. Here, here's death, you know, death penalties for men, death penalties for animals. As we keep reading in Genesis 9, Noah's going to get drunk. His son Ham is going to sin. He'll become the seed of the serpent. We're going to see all of it was not ultimate. Yes, it is clearly an outworking of the seed promise. It's clearly a fulfillment of it. Yet, it's clearly not ultimate. That's how typology works. You see how it unfolds in light of the promise. It's a real thing. It's a literal thing. It's not some made up thing you're getting fancy about. You can actually prove it in the text. And it's a real outworking of the promise. And it literally falls short of the promise. But when we see how it falls, that it's an outworking and that it falls short, we also, we get a glimpse of the picture. What's the picture of what the final fulfillment's going to look like? You have a righteous man who walks with God who walks in the obedience of faith, in his obedience, he constructs a vessel of salvation, and anybody who enters the vessel of salvation in him is going to be saved from the waters of judgment and through him will walk into a renewed creation. That's the picture. Probably everyone in this room can finish the sermon now of how that points to Jesus. And we're going to spend the rest of the sermon considering that this event with Noah and the flood it's a prophecy it's prophesying what is what the final fulfillment of the seed of the woman promise is going to look like and so like Noah we know that Jesus Christ was a a righteous one who will overturn the curse remember Noah's dad saw him as a deliverer from the curse at the end of chapter 5 <clears throat> But with Jesus, his righteousness far exceeds the righteousness of Noah. Because unlike Noah, Jesus isn't going to get drunk. And Jesus is not going to ever sin in any other way. 
And we don't have to speculate about the righteousness of Jesus because the word of God explicitly declares Jesus didn't sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he knew no sin. Hebrews 4.15, he was tempted in all ways as we are, yet he was without sin. And we know that in his sinlessness and in his righteousness, Jesus will be the one to destroy Satan finally and ultimately because 1 John 3, 5 says, you know that Jesus appeared in order to what? Take away sins and in him there is no sin. Three verses later in 1 John 3, we read this about Jesus. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So Noah literally was righteous. Noah really was a deliverer from the curse. It just was not ultimate. Now here comes Christ who is perfectly righteous and provides a perfect and ultimate deliverance from the curse. Like Noah, Jesus was also obedient to the will of God. And through that obedience, Jesus brought about salvation for his people. With Noah, his obedience led to the construction of an ark, a vessel of salvation. With Jesus, it's different, but his salvation is greater. It's different in that he didn't build an ark. He did something greater. That's what I mean by different. In John 14, 31, Jesus said, I do exactly as the Father has commanded me. In Gethsemane, when Jesus was tempted to quit his mission, as he looked the cost of the cross in the eyes, he laid aside his own will, said, not my will, Father, but your will be done, and he was obedient. Philippians 2.8 specifically tells us that it was through obedience to the Father that Jesus went to the cross. Philippians 2.8. And being found in human form, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So just as the obedience of Noah led to the deliverance of all of his people who were in him, much more the obedience of Jesus in going to the cross leads to salvation of his people. And yes, Noah was a deliverer from the curse, but in a non-ultimate way. Jesus, however, is an overturner of the curse in the final and fullest and most ultimate way. Where do we get that? Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. The cross of Christ, the vessel of salvation. That he went to through obedience to God. Unlike Noah, who through the ark was not able to fully eradicate the curse, Jesus, through his obedience, fully removed the curse from his people at the cross. Yes, Noah was a deliverer. That is true. But his deliverance was not ultimate. Christ, on the other hand, he is fully sufficient to deliver his people from judgment because he's a greater deliverer. He's a perfect deliverer. Where do I get that from a text in the Bible that Jesus delivers us from God's judgment? Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, he says, Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. It's a full deliverance. Not one bit of the curse will survive when Jesus returns and all of his deliverance is consummately uh, uh, manifested. Every bit of the curse will be eliminated from the universe through, through the deliverance of Jesus. Now, to conclude tying Christ and Noah together, I want to turn our attention to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 through 21, because this text explicitly connects Jesus and his gospel to the events of the flood. So that, that's where we'll spend the rest of our time. 1 Peter 3, verse 18 through 21. Now, Peter is writing to suffering Christians, and his aim is to give them encouragement in Christ. And in this passage, he points to what the suffering of Christ has accomplished. How, how it's victorious even over the demonic realm, 
which is instrumental in persecuting Christians, which is what Peter's dealing with. Um, and also how all of this corresponds to Noah and the flood, which Peter clearly sees as pointing to Christ. And so because my main point tonight is to show how the flood story is fulfilled in Christ, I'm not going to give a ton of time to some of the speculative manners in the, matters in this text. I'll mention it real quick, but I'm not going to give you like a bunch of views or anything. I'm just going to get mine. Uh, so anyways, uh, 1 Peter 3, 18 through 21, we have an explicit connection to the flood story and the gospel. Let's begin in verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Now, this is, in my opinion, arguably the clearest and most compact gospel verse in the Bible. It tells us Christ suffered once for sins, and obviously that's a reference to the cross. Jesus died on the cross one time, and that one sacrifice was sufficient to fully and completely atone for the sin of his people without there being any need for another sacrifice of himself or anyone or anything else. He suffered once. And the text says also that when Christ died, he did so as the just one who died for the unjust. We are sinners and unjust. Christ is perfect, sinless, and just. And you would think that, that, that we would die at the hands of the just one. However, the opposite is true. The just one died for the unjust ones, and the death he died, he died for their sins. This means he bore the penalty on the cross of the sins of the unjust so that whoever would believe in him would find God's forgiveness. Now, moving forward in verse 18, Peter also tells us another reason for his death. He says it happened that he might bring us to God. Being reconciled to God is the reason Christ died for our sins. Sin separates us from God, and in order for us to be in a right relationship with Him, we needed Christ to die for our sins in order to repair the relationship. Forgiveness is relevant for the purpose of relationships. When there's sin in a relationship, forgiveness of that sin allows the relationship to be repaired, to be healed, and continue to exist. Without forgiveness, there's no relationship. And in order for forgiveness of sins to be possible with God, Jesus had to die for those sins. And the text tells us our forgiveness comes because Jesus was put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ defeated sin for his people and it reconciles us to God. That's the good news of the gospel. And all who trust in Christ, repenting of their sins, will find salvation and reconciliation to God. That's verse 18. I love verse 18. Um, if you're ever at a hospital or something like that, a deathbed, and you're freaking out, and you're like, man, what am I going to say? Well, we can always go to 1 Peter 3.18. It's just easy go-to text uh, to read the Word of God to somebody, share the gospel, uh, super compact, uh, one of my favorite verses. Now, as we go into verses 19 through 21, Peter articulates these gospel truths as fulfillments of the typology of the Noah story. So I want to move now into verses 19 and 20. <clears throat> I'm just going to read the first half of verse 20 for now. So after saying that Jesus at the end of verse 18 was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, it's in the spirit in verse, verse 19, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Okay. Okay. Verses 19 and 20 tell us that there are spirits in prison and that these spirits, these imprisoned spirits are also the ones who did not obey in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark. Now, if you think back to our last message on this, what do you think those are? Noah is assuming that his hearers know Genesis 6. 
So we know that these imprisoned spirits are those who did not obey in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark. Furthermore, we also know the text tells us that having been made alive by the Spirit, Christ preached to them. So there are these spirits, they are imprisoned, and then Christ is made alive by the Spirit and he preached to them. So again, for time's sake, I'm going to be brief here, but I believe these spirits in prison, they are the demonic spirits who had sexual relations with women that we read about during the days of Noah in Genesis 6. He's referring right back to that account. And remember this encounter where these demons took human form and had sexual relations with women. That was the final straw that led God to judge the earth with the flood. And we know here uh, from, from our text that it says these spirits didn't obey in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark. So I take that to mean that God allowed these demonic spirits to be around during the construction of the ark. And they no doubt continued to influence evil and unbelief in those days. And when the floodwaters came and destroyed everyone on earth, I believe God at that point after the flood came bound those evil spirits. So when Christ came as the fulfillment of the flood story, after rising from the dead as the seed of the woman who had crushed Satan's head through the gospel, I believe Christ went and preached to these spirits who were imprisoned by way of declaring and proclaiming his definitive and once and for all victory through the gospel over the demonic realm and by implication any human followers of demonic schemes. Remember, the flood story is an outworking of the seed of the woman promise. This is Satan's defeated. So Christ here comes up and he's not going preaching to the spirit saying, hey, turn to me and live. He's not doing that. This is like holy trash talk. Like, boom, your head is crushed, son. It's over. He is proclaiming his victory over the demonic realm to them. Colossians 2 talks about this very same thing. When he disarmed the demonic realm, what did he say? What is, how does Paul articulate that? He made a public spectacle of them, disarming the powers and the authorities. What does Paul say in Ephesians? That in Christ's gospel, the church is the manifold wisdom of God on display to the what? The heavenly spheres, where the powers and authorities are. There is in these spiritual realms where authorities, where demons and angels are, there's this proclaiming of Christ, of his victory over Satan, his crushing of the serpent's head. He told the serpent and his seed that the head has been crushed. That's what he proclaimed. Now, Peter's writing to a suffering church. And knowing that Christ's gospel has so thoroughly conquered sin, death, and suffering that even the demons, even these spirits in prison, even the demons have had this victory proclaimed to them. How does that help a suffering church? I think it's a comfort that their victory in Christ during evil times is sure and true. Even if they, like Noah and his family, are an extremely small group of believers who are going to be ridiculed and rejected and persecuted by a demonically influenced, unbelieving world for long periods of time. If Christ has conquered the demonic realm through the gospel, it means he's over, he's crushed. That's tied into the serpent promise. From Genesis 3, which this flood is clearly an outworking of. If he's conquered the demonic realm, crushed Satan's head, overturned his works, it has implication to man. And Peter warns in chapter 5, watch out for the devil. He's trying to devour you, right? So here, telling a suffering church, the Lord went and talked some smack to the demonic realm that he crushed their heads. That's a great comfort. The demons and all of the vile stuff that they work through this earth, they are defeated in Christ, including their human instruments that are persecuting me. God is with me. He has saved me. Hallelujah. That's a tremendous comfort. So that's my view on that, uh, on that uh, take. I, I'll throw this one last thing in for your own. If you see how Peter speaks of it in 2 Peter 2, and how Jude talks about it, which are clear parallels of each other, 2 Peter 2 and Jude. Peter is no doubt talking about demons who are in prison. The language is crystal clear. I just don't believe he switched it up and he's talking about something different here. I want to believe that. 
but I don't. Uh, I, I, the text won't allow for it. So anyways, there you go. Um, we can talk more about that at the end. I'm trying to get through for time's sake, so I'm not sharing all the views. So let's go ahead and move forward to how the flood story uh, points to the gospel. Let's uh, go to verse 20. Because they formally did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, we look at, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. I'm going to read it again. I want to read it slowly, and I want you to really listen closely to the wording. Okay? It says, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. While the ark was being prepared, the text says, in which a few, eight persons, were brought safely through water. So this ark, this vessel of salvation, is something the text tells us that through which Noah and his family were what? It's through what? They were uh, Through the ark that they were brought safely through water. When he talks about the ark and then he says, in which a few persons were brought safely to, through water, what is the in which referring to? The ark. And so the ark, this vessel of salvation, is something the text tells us that uh, Noah and his family were, uh, is through that ark, they were brought safely through water. The ark brought these few believers safely through the flood waters. It was the ark constructed by righteous Noah in the obedience of faith that kept the people safe through the waters of judgment. Because of the ark, these waters meant salvation to Noah and those who were with him, while the waters brought judgment to those who were not in the ark. <clears throat> in verse 21, Peter connects the flood to the work of Christ explicitly by saying, baptism which corresponds to this now saves you. Now, that's a statement that many people have turned into heresy. And from this text, they argue, see, water baptism saves you. There are some problems with that view. Uh, the massive problem with this view is that not only does it contradict the rest of the scriptures, but Peter himself, right here in the text, explicitly goes out of his way to tell you he's not talking about water baptism that saves you. Right after saying baptism, which corresponds to this now saves you, he says not as a removal of dirt from the body. Okay, well, what removes dirt from the body? Water. So he's like, I'm not talking about water baptism. Baptism uh, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it's not water baptism that saves you because Peter excludes the removal of dirt from the body here, and clearly water is that which removes dirt from the body. What Peter has in mind here is having an, what the, this baptism that saves you is articulated in terms of an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What, what does that mean? Well, in verse 18, we've already seen that if we're in Christ, he did what? He died for our sins to bring us to God, that he was put to death in the flesh and raised in the spirit. That's right there in our context, right? Verse 18. Here we see that our appeal to God for a good conscience is by being baptized into Christ. And I believe this is a spiritual baptism into Christ. Christ is the one who died for our sins and he was raised from the dead. And when we come to him by faith, we are spiritually baptized into him. Meaning we have a spiritual union with Jesus himself. And because we are in a spiritual union with Christ, his death atones for our sins, the death spoken of in verse 18. And his resurrection shows us that not only was his sacrifice acceptable to God, but also his resurrection begins to be at work in believers because by the Spirit we're raised with Christ to live a new life. Right? Romans 6, Ephesians 10, even Peter back in chapter 1 says we're begotten again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So being baptized into Christ or spiritually being in Christ who died for our sins, that delivers us from the judgment of God. 
So through faith, we're baptized or placed in Christ. And we're brought safely through his judgment, just as being in the ark brought Noah and his family safely through the waters of God's judgment during the flood. Being spiritually baptized in Christ corresponds to being in the ark. In the ark, you're safe from the judgment of God. And in union with Christ, you're safe from the judgment of God. Being in Christ is, corresponds to being in the ark. God's judgment's going to come. But because you're abiding safe in Jesus Christ, if you're a believer who was put to death for our sins and who was raised by the Spirit, you will not be destroyed in judgment just as Noah and his family escaped God's judgment. Because we're in Christ. So this is how the prophetic type of the flood story is fulfilled in Christ. Just, <clears throat> and then water baptism, water baptism is a symbol that represents this reality. We're buried with Christ into the baptismal waters, symbolizing the old man is dead. And we're then raised with Christ to live in newness of life with the confidence that Christ will deliver us from God's judgment because we're now in union with him. In the flood story, the waters were judgment for the unbelievers and salvation for God's people. In the Exodus, the Red Sea brings judgment on the Egyptians, but salvation for God's people. Here in the gospel, the waters of baptism represent judgment being placed on Christ who was buried for us. Judgment's on Christ and salvation is for you when you are in him. So in Christ, we have a greater salvation and deliverance than was experienced in the days of Noah. The curse is fully removed in Christ. Like Noah, Jesus is the head of a new creation. 1 Corinthians 15, 23. It says that the resurrection of Jesus was the first fruits of new creation and that all of his people will also be raised with him at his coming. Noah was the head of a renewed creation, but sin and death persisted through that renewed creation. Jesus, on the other hand, he not only died for sinners, but through the cross, Colossians 1.20 tells us that he's not just reconciling sinners to himself, but he's reconciling all things to himself, things in heaven, things on the earth, Colossians 1.20. Ephesians 1 tells us that God, in, God is summing up all things in Christ. Not just, uh, not just Christians, though that's a wonderful part of it. Revelation 21.5 tells us when the new heavens and the new earth emerge, it's the consummation of Christ making all things new. So in the new creation that Christ ushers in, there is no more pain or crying or sin or suffering or blindness or death or failings or any other thing that the curse brought. So what the Noah story pictured but was unable to consummately accomplish, Jesus has fulfilled in his glorious fullness. So let's review it really quick. Noah, seed of the woman, end of Genesis 5. Dad says he's a deliverer from the curse. He's called a righteous man. He's called a blameless man. He's called one who walks with God. We know the word of God in Hebrews 11:7 7 says that he constructed the ark through the obedience of salvation. Or the obedience of salvation. The obedience of faith. We know that the ark was a vessel of salvation. We know that all of the people and all of the animals entered this ark in connection to Noah. We know the floodwaters of judgment came and destroyed the seed of the serpents. We know that it was the waters of salvation for those who were in the ark, but the waters of judgment and condemnation for those who were not. We know that when the waters were subsiding in Genesis 8, God gave meticulous parallels to the creation account of that, right? We know then Noah as the head let out people, let out animals into a renewed creation and God restates all the creation mandates. All that stuff's right there. I'm not making any of that stuff up. It's clearly in the text. We also know that there was a real and legitimate deliverance that came. However, it fell short. 
We'll see next time sin carries through. Ham is evil. Noah gets drunk. It's, there's a real deliverance, but it's not ultimate. We also know there's a real judgment, but it's not ultimate. The seed of the serpent isn't fully eradicated. We know all that. And then when you fast forward and look how this is fulfilled in Christ, we know Jesus is what? He's the righteous man with no exception. We don't say, oh, except the time he got hammered. We don't have to say that. He is the righteous man with no exception. He is the one who brings about a full deliverance. He is the one who completely eradicates the curse. He is the one who is obedient to the Father. He is the one who through his obedience constructs a perfect vessel of salvation, the cross. He is the one when we're placed in him will bring you safely through the waters of God's judgment. He is the one who as he brings in a new creation, there's not going to be one thing of the curse left over. When the new creation comes in, everything's eradicated. That's what Revelation 21 tells us. Nothing unclean will enter this new creation, the new heaven, the new earth. Nothing impure. The outside of the dogs, the murderers, the idolaters, the liars, nothing unclean will enter into it. The the renewal of creation will be full, it'll be ultimate, it'll be consummate, and it'll be through this greater deliverer. It'll be through Jesus Christ. Furthermore, we also know that the judgment of Christ will be full and consummate and ultimate. Satan, the demons, and all who follow him, they will be cast into the eternal lake of fire where the smoke of their torment rises day and night forever and ever. Amen. There won't be any, oh, the seed of the serpent snuck into the new creation. That's not going to happen. There's no, not going to be any hands that kind of fall through the crack. They will all be ultimately and consummately judged. So the judgment of the flood story falls short of the fulfillment of Christ and the salvation falls short. However, we get a pretty cool picture. And so that's typology. Flood story is a type. It's a type of Christ. It's a type of salvation. It's a type of judgment. The anti-type, which is just a fancy way of saying the fulfillment of the type, is Christ's perfect salvation. Christ himself is the perfect deliverer. Christ's consummate judgment. And all of those things, both the type and the anti-type, can be very easily and explicitly shown in Scripture. It's hermeneutically accountable because you're not pulling rabbits out of hats. It's all you build up the type from literal, historical, biblical realities. You show the anti-type comes from literal, historical, biblical realities. And it's very hermeneutically accountable. And when you see that, hopefully the promise of John 7 comes true in your heart. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water flow from within you. By this, he meant the Spirit. So this new creation that Christ has begun through the gospel, this keeping you safe from God's judgment as you're placed in him, Jesus, this perfect ark of salvation, as you're placed in him, that will keep you perfectly safe from the judgment. You will be in Christ. Why? Can you imagine being in the ark sea like, whoa, look at that water. <laughs> man, look at all this stuff. That is crazy. And you, you have this confidence that you're kept safe in this vessel of salvation. And as maybe you peer you know, out the window and see this terrible judgment, there's this fear of the Lord that's inside of you. Not fear that I'm going to fall in the ocean. I've got a sufficient vessel of salvation, but just this trembling. I can't believe I'm not out there. And so your love and your uh, worship of God and your gratitude is strengthened by being in the ark and by seeing, whoo, look at that judgment. I'm glad I'm not in it. Isn't that exactly what Paul said in Romans 9 was the purpose of God's wrath? To show the vessels of mercy, the power of his glory through his wrath. God is really, really big and powerful. His salvation is mighty. His judgment is mighty. And when you're in Christ, you are safe from this judgment. But you can tremble at it. You're like, whoa. And the renewed creation that's coming, that's your heritage. You'll be in it forever. There will be no more curse 
in any way, shape, or form. Christ will fully re renew all things. So, that is the Christ, uh, sorry, the Noah story and how it points to Christ. It isn't merely uh, about just a good guy in, in a land of bad guys. It's not merely just something to teach animals with. Oh, these things are okay. It is gloriously Christ-centered. So are there, I know that's a lot of information. Are there any questions uh, or comments anybody has? There's one thing to support the point about typology is that's exactly how the inspired New Testament writers are interpreting these things. So it's not something you're making up. You're, yeah. The point of you taking us to Peter is to say, look, this is how it's being interpreted. Uh huh. Yep. Peter looks at that story and just bang, by the Spirit, uh, writes that out. Yep. And so this is, this, is, this is different than allegory. Allegory would take something that is totally unrelated to the text. And, what's that? Allegory takes something from the text that has nothing to do with the text. So like uh, um, Abraham's pit or the pitch that, that went into the ark. Oh, see the pitch, it holds wood together, you know. And so it's like the pitch is the Holy Spirit because the Spirit unites and binds all things. It's like, what? Like That, that had nothing to do with the, that, 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 that. That's not it. That is allegory. Taking something in the Old Testament that has nothing to do with it. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree. See, that's Jesus. What? Uh, Jesus died on a tree. He planted a tree. Come on, church. Uh, that, that's allegory. And that's nonsense. And, you know, we, we, we're going to, even if it's good theology, it's important to correct that because it's horrible interpretation, which is going to open the floodgates of wolves trampling the people of God with false doctrine. But typology is very, very different. It's easy to demonstrate the type. It's easy to demonstrate the anti-type. That's the difference between typology and allegory. And believe me, we're going to see this millions of times. Well, not really, but lots of times as we continue through the book of Genesis. It's full of types, not allegory. So, um, and, then, and so the inspired writer, who the Spirit... In the New Testament is inspiring them. The Spirit put types in the Old Testament. The inspired writer is now looking and by the inspiration of the Spirit sees the types because the Spirit put it there. And he's like, oh, hey, there it is. So does that make sense? Are there any questions or comments? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not sure about that one. Um, anyone else? All right, let's pray. Uh, and then we'll have our time of fellowship. Lord, we thank you for um, this wonderful story of the flood. We thank you for how it worked according to your promise. We thank you for the glorious way you fulfilled it in your son. And more than that, God, we just thank you for allowing us by faith to be placed in your son. Thank you for that, God. And thank you for providing the way for sinners to be delivered from your wrath. You did not have to do that. You would be no less good if you didn't. And so we just praise you for that. And thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for allowing us to be in Christ, Lord. And Lord, we love you. And we thank you that one day Jesus is going to renew all of creation in consummate manner, God. And, and there won't be any trace of the curse in any of the creation. God, we praise you for that. We love you for that. We worship you for that. And you, you told us, Lord, that if we believe in you, as the scripture says, streams of living water will flow from within us. So I just pray for everybody here, God, that you'll strengthen our joy in you through how this uh, points to Christ and that it will bear fruit in all sorts of ways uh, throughout our week. Lord, we love you and we pray your blessing will be upon us now as we fellowship and go into our weeks and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.